what exactly is a passion? As we come closer to the end of this season of Lent, our gaze turns toward the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus during Holy Week, the Paschal Triduum, and Easter. The important thing to remember is that when we talk about the passion, we're talking about it in a very large context. So what exactly is a passion? It's actually a lot of things over time. If you think about the Gospels for a second, from the perspective of them being literature, the Passion is a carefully arranged work of art. The Gospels were not written that closely to Jesus actually dying. The first scripture is probably, the first Gospel is probably written somewhere around 50 AD, so at least 20 to 30 years after Jesus has died. 30 years seems like nothing in the context of 2000, but it seems like a lot when I think about what the world will look like for me in 30 years. Passions have been performed in the church for a long time. The first passions come from the scriptures themselves, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and even these stories develop out of each other. So what does this mean? Yes, one author is responsible for writing each book of the gospel, but from another angle, these people are also kind of like scribes. The earliest Christians reflected on Jesus' life using their own memories and the stories they heard. The Gospels were never meant to be simply a historical telling of Jesus' life. They're also meant to be art. They are in and of themselves one expression of what it means to be a Christian. The first time a passion is written from another perspective, kind of uh, um, someone writing about the passion, happened back in the 4th century uh, with a woman named Egeria, who traveled to the Holy Land and wrote about what she saw. She saw people performing or acting out the Passion, along with movable liturgies that happened throughout Holy Week to remember and celebrate the Passion. From here, we begin to have evidence from church documents that the Gospel versions of the Passion were each read once as part of four different liturgies during Holy Week. Musical versions of the Passion follow a similar trajectory as the general trends of sacred music that we've discussed in the first three weeks of this course. We first have examples of chanted Passions, with specific types of melodies assigned to different characters, as well as parts for the crowd. During the Middle Ages, we see the rise of Passion plays, which were full-on productions with actors and singers that depicted the Passion and death of Jesus. This form continues to develop throughout the Renaissance and the Baroque, especially in the German Lutheran tradition, from which we get Bach's passions. J.S. Bach wrote at least three passions on the Gospels of Mark, John, and Matthew, but we only have the music for John and Matthew. Bach's passions, especially the St. Matthew, are the crown jewel of musical settings, not just of the passion, but really of any large-scale piece of sacred music. They are universally considered masterpieces across artistic and historical standards in their music, pacing, dramatic development, theological depth, and ritual development. Now, what does this have to do with us? What the passion does is allow us to contextualize and align our own suffering with the suffering of Jesus. In some ways, the passion is a guidebook for how not to act. And yet, in almost every scene, the high priests, the apostles, the people who are closest to Jesus betray him, walk away from him, and even help capture him. This quote from biblical scholar Father Raymond Brown about the disciple who runs away naked when Jesus is captured in the Garden of Gethsemane in Mark's Gospel is a beautiful meditation for seeing ourselves and Jesus in the Passion. Quote, A young man who does seek to follow, but... When seized as Jesus had been, this would-be disciple leaves in the hands of his captors the linen garment that had clothed him and runs away naked. The disciple fleeing naked is symbolic simply of the total abandonment of Jesus by his disciples. The first disciples to be called left nets and family, indeed everything to follow him. But this last disciple, who at first sought to follow Jesus, ultimately leaves everything to get away from him." End quote. 
In the midst of our suffering and the suffering of those around us, it's too easy to forget who we are, what we are made for, and how our relationship with God can divine, define a truly hopeful life. During this Holy Week, let us engage deeply with the Passion, and through the Passion, learn to see ourselves and each other with the compassionate eyes of Jesus during his final days. Thank you.